morning. You are with the House Government Operations Committee uh, in what is one of the final days of the 2020 marathon legislative session. Uh, we have a bill that has come over to us from the Senate that contains various um, emergency provisions. And I just wanna spend a few minutes orienting ourselves here this morning because as we went through the bill the first time yesterday, there were a number of places in the bill where uh, members of the committee had questions or concerns. And so I just want to uh, level set our expectations here that we are going to strip out any part of the bill that is not critical to happen before January because um, in reality, if we have parts of the bill that, uh, that aren't time sensitive and that we could do when we get back into session in January, I would rather do it then and make sure we take the time to get it right while, while we um, are fresh in the beginning of a legislative session instead of rushing it here at the end of a legislative session. Um, so anything that's not time sensitive, I would aim to uh, to remove from the bill and uh, things that are time sensitive, we will concentrate on and um, and take the time to get right. And so uh, what we have in front of us this morning is a proposed draft of the things that uh, at first blush seem to be time sensitive. And I am willing to let anyone who would like to make the case that their issue that was contained in previous drafts um, should be added into this draft, um, but it needs to be things that are already pretty well uh, formulated, uh, things that don't have major concerns or flaws that we're gonna have to spend a bunch of committee time correcting um, because we are in the waning hours uh, and need to, to get uh, only the critical stuff moving towards the floor. Um, so I think what I'll do first is uh, is have Betsy Ann run us, or I'm not sure if it's Betsy Ann or Tucker, given the area of law that we're in, but um, have you run us through what our assessment was of the things that are time sensitive? And, um, and then we can hear from the folks who are here with us in committee if they have a pitch to make about anything that they would like to see added to the bill. Um, and then I believe what makes the most sense is for us to not vote on this this morning, but to maybe come back 15 minutes before the floor this afternoon because it makes me a little uncomfortable that we don't have that long list of witnesses who were with us yesterday here today to see what changes we're making. And I just wanna make sure that we give anyone the opportunity to make a pitch for their, for their things to be included if they have a fully baked concept. So uh, who's running us through the language? Hi, well, I can start. Um... Tucker and I are handling this bill together because we each have different subject areas that are in this bill. Um, so for the record, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council, and uh, Madam Chair, with your direction, I went through the bill and of my subjects that are the local elections, professional regulation, and sheriff provisions. That's the second half of the bill. And I went through and I looked at those provisions that appear to already be addressed um, due to laws that the General Assembly already enacted. So I'll come back to the local elections, but in the professional regulation sections, it appears that all but one of the sections are already addressed pursuant to Act 91, which allowed for these same provisions um, to be in effect during the COVID state of emergency. I'm the only one that is not currently addressed is section nine, which allows OPR to extend license terms. Um, in the sheriff funding section, um, that is already being covered right now pursuant to Act 100, which allowed sheriffs to use uh, the county's uh, reserve funds during the COVID-19 state of emergency. So the, that sheriff emergency funding section is already in effect now. Um, Tucker, do you want to address your sections um, and what it, it, it may be addressed right now? Sure. Uh, the open meeting law provisions are currently in effect and will stay in effect throughout the COVID-19 state of emergency. Um, 
So as long as that state of emergency continues, the provisions you reviewed are available right now and will continue to be. Um, the quasi-judicial proceeding uh, section, section two and three are also currently in effect and will continue uh, during the state of emergency. Um, the moratoria on uh, water and sewer service disconnections is in effect and will continue. Um, the last piece, um, oh, excuse me, the municipal deadline extensions is in effect and will continue. And the last piece concerning the uh, co-mingling or borrowing from town highway funds, that was uh, made a use it or lose it by December 31st uh, provision. And it is set to expire after calendar year 2020. However, the provision that you were looking at in this bill in front of you didn't change that. It set out the effective date of the repeal until July 1st, 2021. So there was no pickup on uh, January 1st in the bill in front of you anyway. So sections one through six are either currently in effect and will continue into 2021, potentially, or um, there was no urgency to get this done by uh, January 1st. Thanks. So that left you with the um, S-354's provisions regarding local elections, and those begin on um, page nine in section seven of the bill as passed the Senate. And those two sections, there's section seven and section eight. Um, section seven was uh, allowing during a state of emergency, uh, the legislative body to move the date and time of an annual or special meeting and then section eight um, addressed the ability of the legislative body to apply Australian ballots to annual or special meetings during a state of emergency if those meetings are 60 days out, for meeting 60 days out. So those provisions are not currently addressed or won't be addressed for next year because pursuant to Act 92, the first GovOps Act, um, the one local elections provision that was in regard to Australian ballot that allows a legislative body to vote to apply the Australian ballot system to an annual or special meeting of the municipality is only limited to the year 2020. They municipal legislative bodies only have that authority to do that in the year 2020 and only for municipal elections held in the year 2020. So when you were reviewing this um, bill yesterday, one of the concerns was what's going to happen for town meeting. Um, this committee was discussing whether there needs to be some uh, safety measures in place to allow town meeting to be conducted in a different manner um, in the year 2021. So if you go to your committee page, um, Tucker and I put together this draft 1.1 for your committee consideration or discussion today um, to this, this language right now is uh, put together as a strike all of S-354 so that the only thing that would remain of S-354 would be um, municipal meetings next year. There's two sections of it, um, there are two subsections of it. The first one would be in regard to the annual meetings of towns and school districts next year in the year 2021. Um, the language would provide for something other than the floor meetings where everybody um, gets together. The language would provide in subsection A for only for annual meetings of a town or school district that said it provides that notwithstanding any provision of the law to the contrary, due to the circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, in the year 2021, each annual town meeting or representative annual town meeting and each annual town school district meeting shall, shall be held pursuant to the Australian ballot system, a requirement that all each town meeting be held pursuant to the Australian ballot system, unless the town can meet one of two conditions. Condition one is that the town or school district 
will hold its annual or representative annual meeting through electronic means in which the municipality uses techn technology that permits the legal voters of the municipality to attend and participate in the meeting and the public to access it. So that's potential one um, condition. Or secondly, by the end of this year, the town or school district determines that it will hold its annual meeting or representative annual meeting in a manner that is consistent with the state guidance on indoor meetings that is in effect on the date of its determination. A couple things on this. Why the December 31st meeting? Um, that's the 60 days in advance of um, the March 2nd, I believe, annual town meeting date. So that, that's, that's the 60 day window that was discussed on the Senate side that towns need to be able to decide whether they're gonna, um, should be able to hold their meetings by Australian ballot. Secondly, um, they would have to be sure that by the end of this year, they're gonna be able to hold their annual meeting um, in a manner consistent with state guidance on indoor meetings that's in effect on the date of that determination just because they're gonna to have to plan to hold, if they're, they're gonna be able to hold a floor vote where all the voters come in, they're gonna to have to ensure that the that annual meeting can be held um, in a safe manner consistent with state guidance. It's possible that state guidance is could change after the end of this year, um, but it seems at least in this first draft for planning purposes that there's gotta be some sort of um, uh, variable that they have to base their decision on. So this is just a first draft of this. You can talk more about the logistics of what is workable, um, but big picture, this would say, every town and school district has to hold their annual meeting by Australian ballot, unless they're gonna be able, unless they're gonna do it electronically or unless they're gonna be able to meet state guidelines for holding a regular um, floor meeting at that annual town meeting. The subsection B is in regard to special meetings because subsection A is only in regard to annual. I don't know if you want to address this, um, but if there's any other special meetings, this language would allow the municipal legislative body during the COVID-19 state of emergency to vote to apply the Australian ballot system to an upcoming special meeting 60 days in advance of that meeting if the legislative body determines it's necessary to do so in order to protect the public. Um, that's the same language or similar language to what appears in S-354 as past Senate. Um, it would apply only to special meetings. I don't know if you wanted to address special meetings. If you did, that language is there as a potential solution for that. And then because the bill would be only about town and school district meetings, you could have a title change on page two and lines 14 and 14, 14 and 15. Okay, questions from committee members. John Thank, you. Thank you. Um, so just if you recall, Suzanne Young testified yesterday um, with respect to Australian ballots and recommended a, an amendment to what was then section eight of the bill um, to, you know, to allow all towns to, you know, basically default to Australian ballots um, as the first initiative. She testified that there, the governor had set aside $2 million um, to allow towns um, to vote by Australian ballots. And so that's what um, subsection a does is default to an Australian ballot. But then um, in subsection one and two, it, it does give uh, the legislative body two options. One is a recommendation from BLCT um, to hold an electronic um, town meeting. And the second one is, and this would really apply to probably only small towns, um, is, is allow them to hold a town, a, a regular town meeting with people um, if they can comply with this, the state guidance that's in existence for indoor meetings on December 31st, 2020, or whenever they choose to take a vote 
um, with respect to that. So I just I just want to explain where where this language came from. Um, I think the, the, the benefit of, of just defaulting to the, the Australian ballot right away is that you don't need 200 plus towns um, taking action between now and December 31st of the year. Um, there gives more certainty um, to what could happen. And then for those towns that wanna to choose to go a different course, um, which I think will be only a few towns, um, it gives them two options for how to hold town meeting. Thanks, John. Rob. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, the member from Wilmington took most of my questions. So one question I do have is that the $2 million that was initially there, um, I can see, I support this for sure, but my concern is, is that we're putting an additional cost on the towns and municipalities. Is there that $2 million, is it still gonna be available? as a resource for them is, and I don't exactly know who I'm asking this question of. <laughs> Anybody want to unmute if they know the answer to that question? That, that was my understanding from um, Sus Suzanne Young's testimony yesterday. I mean, we may just want to confirm that with her. Um, I think that's a fair question, Rob, um, but that appeared to be um, her commitment and um, and there's also her suggestion to, to modify the language similar to what you see in the draft. Well, I, I do recall that the money was in the governor's proposed budget, but I thought somehow it got moved around and reallocated. But I will ask that question. Thank you. That's the end. Oh. And maybe we could have, or one of you can have a check-in with um, House Approps to see uh, what the status is of that um, funding recommendation is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other committee questions on what remains? <clears throat> so Karen Horn, I'm wondering if anyone in your shop has been tracking the issue of the governor's recommend for uh, municipal voting? Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I I just got booted from one office room to another. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Um, we, we did just look at the draft that Betsy Ann has up on the um, committee webpage. Uh, we would urge you to, um, to include the other provisions that were in the bill as it came over from the Senate. It just provides some certainty to municipalities in the event that there's a different disaster declared by the governor or emergency declared by the governor going forward. And um, 2020 seems to be the year of never ending disasters. So uh, we, we do think those provisions would be very helpful. I think that the way that you've proposed the uh, language regarding Australian ballot for town meeting 2021 is helpful. It does leave municipalities a way to hold an in-person meeting if they think that they can do that in compliance with the governor's guidance. And there will be some smaller municipalities, I'm thinking particularly up in the kingdom, that will be very interested in holding in-person town meetings. I, I think down on the in the southern part of the state also in some of those very small towns they're um, looking forward to holding in person meetings. So, uh, in summary, we, we think that the language that you're proposing in the amendment is helpful. Um, but we would urge you to consider including the other sections that are in the bill that came over from the Senate. Thank you. And by that, you mean the quasi-judicial boards and sewer disconnects and municipal deadline extension? Yes, yeah. Sections one through seven, I believe it is, in that I don't have the bill in front of me anymore, I apologize. 
So um, has anyone in your shop been tracking the appropriations uh, negotiations with respect to the $2 million that was in the governor's budget for municipal elections? Well, um, I have to say I've temporarily, temporarily lost track of that in, in light of the other legislation you were dealing with yesterday, but I can find out for you um, and, and let you know uh, if that $2 million is, is still in there. I can send you an email, Madam Chair. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, any questions from committee members for Karen? All right, so next I would like to uh, hear from Chris and or Lauren with respect to the proposal that you have in, in front of you and also was there anything that you felt was very time critical out of the sections of the bill that are not contained in this draft? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll go first. Um, and appreciate the time in front of the committee today. For the record, this is Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And we do appreciate the legislature's attention to these issues and your foresight in, in thinking about which emergency powers might be necessary. We uh, followed this on the Senate side and have no objection to the open meeting law provisions um, with the, a few changes that I think were suggested by the Press Association. We were also fine with sections seven and eight on local elections. Uh, moving date and time and, and going to Australian ballot. Um, I won't speak for Lauren Hibbert here, director of OPR, but I believe that we were um, all good with the professional licensing provisions that are in the bill. Um, but the one thing uh, that, I, that I would bring up uh, that's not in the bill and is a question that we keep getting is uh, petition signature requirements for local elections. Uh, we've waived, waived that requirement for the 2020 under the temporary directive that we have, but for local elections, uh, there, there have been some issues, some questions about um, uh, signature requirements for petitions for town meeting, and, and we've been getting them in two categories. One are petitions to place an article on the ballot, like social service appropriations are the most common, uh, but there are all sorts of questions that could be petitioned to place on the ballot. Uh, for those, the, the select board or the school board always um, and already has the authority not to require a petition. And I think there's an, a BLCT policy on that. Maybe Karen can speak to that, um, that they can just place the article on the ballot by request. So for uh, an appropriation, they could say as they could adopt a policy that says as long as they're not asking for more than they did the previous year, it can automatically go on the ballot without a petition. And so that would alleviate any need for gathering signatures on those. Um, so that's one way to approach it. Or you might consider either waiving or reducing the number of signatures needed to get onto the ballot. But the other kind of petition is for um, candidates running for local office. And you can't just waive those. Uh, those are statutory, and so the, a board can't waive that requirements on its own. But you could consider waiving or relaxing the signature gathering requirements for local candidates. So that's that's one issue that we keep hearing about in our office and is not addressed in this bill. Um, but with respect to everything else, we were we're fine with the Senate passed version. Um, and I will say, just seeing the. The 1.1 draft uh, just now and taking a, a very quick look at it. Um, I, I do think I need to talk to Will Senning about, uh, and, and we need to put our heads together on electronic town meetings and maybe kind of security and access issues around that. I'm not entirely certain how that would work. I'm not sure that's been totally figured out yet. So to, to us, I think we would say that feels a little bit rushed and I know it's really critical um, that you address this but I don't feel prepared to say at this point uh, draft 1.1 with the electronic town meeting um, is something we're entirely comfortable with uh, but we could try to get an answer back to you just just as quick as possible I'd want to talk to Secretary Condos and, and Director of Elections Will Senning about that. That would be very helpful thank you for doing that. Um, committee questions for Chris Winters?
John Gannon. Thank you. Um, Chris, so would it be your recommendation for us to um, either waive the petition requirement for um, local candidates um, or would that be your recommendation? Uh, I think there are two ways you could go about that. I think uh, waiving the signature requirement would certainly alleviate any concerns about having to gather signatures. We did that um, previously under the temporary elections directive. We did see some additional candidates hopping on that I think maybe otherwise would not have. Not It wasn't the Wild West, the total Wild West, like uh, some people feared that it would be, but we do have a few more candidates on the ballot now, I think, because of that. Another request and, and possibility is to require some sort of uh, electronic signature. So now, whether that's a, a picture of a signature or an online petition, um, some other form of signature gathering requirement, and that also has some access issues with it. Um, and then I guess a third option would be to reduce the number of signatures. So you know, instead of 5% uh, of the registered voters or whatever the requirement might be, you could reduce that percentage or that number of signatures to be able to get on the ballot, thereby reducing the number of in-person contacts for signatures. So following up on the electronic signature thing, could that be, for example, which would be the simplest technology, an email from a voter um, saying, you know, I support this petition and I'm a registered voter in you know, for example, my town, Wilmington. I think that's a possibility. We just want to define what electronic signature means. Thank you. Betsy Ann. And I just want to confirm that when we're talking about voter signatures, we're talking not only about for candidate petitions, but petitions for a public question on a local election ballot. Well, I guess then I have a follow-up question for Chris on that. My understanding of what Chris said is that towns already have the ability to waive that requirement. Is that correct, Chris? Yes, that's correct. So I think that's probably less of an issue for you if you didn't want to address that one. All right, Karen, did you have a response to that? Yes, um, thank you. Not having seen language on this, but in the Senate Government Operations Committee, we urge them to um, not change the requirements for uh, signatures for petitions of questions on the ballot, um, because that if anybody could put any item on the ballot, you might end up with some um, very uh, bizarre and not necessarily related to local government questions. So. Um, I, I would ask that the committee leave the petition language as it is um, right now, the signature signature on petition language as it is. Um, I, I think that we could talk a little bit about the signatures for candidates for local office. Um, I, it would be helpful to see some language there. Okay, thanks. Rob. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to make sure I'm clear when we're talking about signatures for petitions. Um, or if, if we're, if you have um, an entity out there that says, uh, you know, the committee to reelect John Gannon as dog catcher, and they want to petition to get on the ballot for funding this year or let me next year or is that who we're talking about here when we talk about a public question or is it a, a, the public question something that's more related to the town issues it, it could be either um the, the public questions the the uh, select boards have the ability to put those on of their own accord without a petition from the public so with respect to appropriations i think very easily they could say, uh, you know, the, the Vermont Food Bank was on for $1,000 last year. We, we will put them on again this year for $1,000. Um, but as Karen pointed out, any other public question, if you say there's no petition requirement at all, 
any other public question could be put on by the public. Um, okay. so with respect to that category, you're probably fine leaving it alone as long as the towns are aware. And I think VLCT has been making them aware um, that they can put those public uh, nonprofit ap appropriations onto the ballot. Um, it's with respect to candidates that I think you, you still have an issue with people having to go out and collect signatures on petitions in order to get on the ballot for local candidates. That helps. Thank you for the clarification, Chris. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's the end. And, and just for my own um, clarification, so when I hear the Secretary of State's office, when you had mentioned earlier that the town has the authority to waive voters signatures for petitions for public questions it's not that they were would be waiving the requirement just that the town legislative body would be adding that language on the ballot um on their on the voters behalf not that they yeah. were waiving the requirement to yeah that's okay. correct it. that it's not a waiver it's them putting it on of their own accord okay thank you do they understand that that's how how you read that language? I mean, it's sort of a backdoor way of uh, of achieving that. I'm not sure I would have understood that the select board's ability to put that on on behalf of the voters means we can set our own rules about that. Karen, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I believe select boards do understand that. And for quite a few towns around the state, they generally put on the list of nonprofits that are asking for funding without petitions because they know that they, the select board has that authority. So if you've asked in previous years, they'll just put you on um, the, the next ballot. Okay, thank you. Other um, questions? Rob? Well, I do have, sorry, yeah. Um, I should know this, but I don't. Has the select boards always had that authority or is there anything unique about this time that we're in that gives them that authority? As we understand that they have always had that authority. Okay, along with any agency could go out and get petitions signed. And if you meet a certain threshold, then it has to be placed on the ballot as well. Uh, yeah, 5% of the registered voters in the town. Okay. Okay, thank you. Chris? Madam Chair, if I could, just to give the committee a little bit more to think about on the electronic town meeting, the some of the things that we're thinking through are how you would verify that voters are who they say they are in an electronic town meeting. Um, and what about people without computers you know, being able to access in a, in a different way? And a lot of towns have figured that out for, for regular meetings, but those are a couple of the issues that uh, we would raise as concerns on an electronic town meeting. Okay, so committee, can we have a discussion about that right now so that we can try to get a sense of how we wanna move forward with this? Anyone have a strong preference or thought on Rob? Well, I don't know if I have a strong preference or thought, Madam Chair, but it, it, it does seem that uh, those are fairly valid questions and if timing is of the essence. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to address those as quickly as we'd like. Um, so if, if that is a concern, then it would be, a, I guess you just automatically de default to Australian ballot. I don't know. Not that I'm advocating. Other questions? Warren, hi, welcome. I, I, I just got the message. Uh, I don't know whether it was you or Andrea that sent me a, a text saying we were meeting. I, you know, it's maybe a surprise to some of you, but I don't live on my electronic devices when I'm not 
anticipating being in a meeting. So I just found out that we were meeting. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, just to orient you, we are looking at a draft 1.1 of a highly pared down version of 354, the bill that we walked through yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, our intention is to find uh, the provisions that are critical to move forward, time sensitive to move forward right now, and um, and the ones that are uh, fully baked enough that we feel we can put them forward right now without unintended uh, consequences. So I, can, I can find that on our committee page probably. Who sure can, because Andrea has popped that right up there. <clears throat> Draft 1.1, not edited. Is that the one? That's the one. Okay. All right, Jim Harrison. I, yeah, I'm totally fine with going the direction of the new amendment today and doing what gets um, in place for town meeting and then come January to look at the longer term picture. And I think the league certainly raises some good points. You know, do we have to go through all this for the next emergency, especially if it's out of session, but in all likelihood, we're still under the same state of emergency come January. So I don't think any of the laws we put into place earlier uh, provisions um, need to be adjusted right now. So I, I would, concur with moving forward on the amendment and um, I'm not still not sure I understand all the petition issues but as long as the select board has the ability to waive them I think it gives them their flexibility if they don't then we got to tweak it so thank you well it sounds like they do for ballot measures and possibly not for candidates running for local offices so I think we are hearing some consensus around needing to needing to specify that well i guess do we want to allow the local legislative body to lessen the requirement or waive the requirement or do we want to just waive it ourselves knowing that it could open up the wild wild west and yeah madam chair i mean i guess um you know we might err on lessening them for candidates. I only say that in that um, if you have a couple people that are looking to run for office, the ones making the decisions are the ones, the incumbents. Um, so there is a potential conflict that, um, so I just throw that out there. I mean, we did have more candidates file without the petitions, but it wasn't that many more perhaps. Uh, so some of us were surprised on that, so. All right, Bob Hooper is very patiently holding up his real hand. Um, I agree on the, the first part with everybody else. The second part, I think that although we didn't see the Wild West, it'll become more accessible to people, I think, and we might very well see the Wild West. So we might be well, position to look to get a sheriff in town if we stick with that stupid analogy. But, Mike uh, Merwicki. Um, well, well, we didn't see the Wild West. Um, I, know I, I had a primary this August and uh, for two seats, there were five candidates who showed up. One is uh, someone who has been politically opposed to me and uh, and his organization has run candidates against me, uh, the, the gun owners of Vermont. And on their web, their Facebook page, they were giving the advice that people should run in Democratic primaries to, to make it harder for Democrats to, to win. Um, as it turned out, they didn't get very many votes, but, uh, and then another person, uh, or actually two other people signed up to be on the ballot and basically never even campaigned. So um, not that we want to limit, but I think making people go out and get some signatures, whether they're electronic 
or uh, in, in some way um, doesn't diminish who's actually going to run. So committee, how would you like to try to achieve that? Give that some thought. Do we want to say that a candidate needs to have 25 people uh, either sign or attest on their behalf that, that they would like to see them added to the ballot? Rob? I'm just, uh, you know, listening to my esteemed friend from Northern Mass there. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, there's something that doesn't quite seem fair here that we're going to hold candidates running for a local office to a higher standard, especially if this state of emergency is still in effect. Why would we hold them to a higher and a different standard than what we held those for statewide or, you know, local representative office? There's something about that that just doesn't seem quite fair. Mike? Um, perish the thought that I would disagree with my committee state house seatmate. Um, I'm, uh, I don't know that I'm looking to to change that, I, I thought we should have had some sort of signatures for the primary. And, uh, and, and not that Republicans can't run as Democrats or Democrats run as Republicans, but I think what we did was we opened, for instance, the person I spoke to, been a lifelong Republican, and then all of a sudden decided to run in a Democratic primary. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to push one way or the other, but I think that we might be careful about opening the gates to to people who aren't necessarily um, maybe respecting the process. Okay, uh, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I don't want to seem to be pushing either, but the reality is that in the world of business an electronic signature is not an unusual thing. Uh, an email is hard to clone, maybe not, but everybody statewide on down should have access to soliciting from people in their constituencies, 25, 50, whatever signatures. Um, I sort of thought it was a mistake to just throw it wide open uh, and I continue to doesn't have anything to do really with party. It has more to do with support in your, amongst your local constituencies. So I lean towards saying 25 emails. We made that same sort of uh, change to our union election things. You have to go out and do something. You can't just fall into a race. Um. Karen has her actual hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd just like to make two points that, that may be helpful. The, the first is that the median sized town in, in Vermont is 1200 population. And so 5% of the registered voters is not actually that many people. Um, and secondly, we do have um, the ability at the local level to use electronic signatures. I believe you've given electronic signature authority for wills and advanced directives since COVID started. So it does seem that there are a lot of instances where electronic signatures are safe enough to be used. And, and this would seem to be another such instance. All right, any other committee discussion on this? All right, clear as mud. So what I'd like to do is give Lauren Hibbert an opportunity to weigh in on the OPR sections of the bill that, um, that came over from the Senate and tell us if any of those are time sensitive and critical to move now. So welcome, Lauren. 
Hi, good afternoon. For the record, Lauren Hibbert, Director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Um, crucial, um, perhaps not, because we do have Act 91, which is in effect until March 31st of 2021. Um, I think that um, each one of those sections that are related to OPR are necessary in the long term. Um, I think there was a lot of um, good and hasty work um, done um, when COVID came to Vermont. And um, I've done some reflecting both in testifying um, on the Senate side related to this bill, but also just in a quiet moments, how lucky we were that the legislature was in session. Um, if the legislature were not in session, and we were hit similarly, um, OPR would have really struggled to maintain its um, daily function. And I'm very grateful for the timing. Um, so are all of those sections absolutely necessary today? I think the answer um, logically is no, because Act 91 provisions are um, valid through March. But I would um, strongly urge this committee if those sections are taken out of this bill, um, to, to contemplate um, moving those in the next legislative session, because I think for me, what I've learned is we just don't know what's gonna happen um, in the next week, month, year. And um, I think this bill is uh, proactive and smart for the future emergency. Okay, thank you. Questions from committee members? All right. Thank anyone you. Anyone else want to jump in on? Oh, anyone else want to jump in on OPR or go back to municipal petitions or special meetings or annual meetings? All right. So uh, we have Ross Connolly with us. Ross, I wanted to. So um, welcome you to uh, share any thoughts that you have with us, either with respect to the version of the bill that came over from the Senate or this pared down version that is uh, before us now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Ross Connolly. I live in Hardwick. Um, I'm uh, in support of the uh, bill that you're, you have under uh, review uh, that came from the Senate. Um, I am um, speaking from my experience as um, 30 plus years as the uh, co-publisher and editor of the Hardwick Gazette, and um, as well as my current service as an elected member of the uh, um, Judevine Memorial Library Board of Trustees in Hardwick. And um, having um, seen public meetings from two perspectives, um, I uh, just emphasize the uh, public's right to know is as important to citizens as it is to those who represent them on boards and commissions and whatever. And um, in light of that, I just um, uh, want to emphasize my um, support of the uh, um, requiring access information, uh, keeping the requirement in the current bill of the uh, uh, requirement that access information be made available as part of um, any meeting's agenda. Um, um, I think it's just critically important that uh, for a member of the public uh, to uh, attend a, a public meeting uh, should be at the discretion of the individual and not dependent on obtaining that information uh, from a member of the public body. Um, I, I think the location in quotes um, of a meeting is as important to public participation as um, uh, the date and time of the meeting. And, and thus the uh, um, access needs to be there. And, um, um, and it is in the bill as a should or shall. And I, I just think that's critically important uh, to maintain keep. Um, there have been concerns raised that if providing that information on an agenda um, is done, it could uh, lead, expose a meeting to Zoom bombing. 
Um, I think that's legitimate, although I think it's fairly uncommon. And um, I think the solution to that um, is a technological problem um, that the, uh, um, any meeting, whether in person or by electronic means, um, uh, it's up to the chair to control the decorum of any meeting. And there are technical ways to maintain order. And so I don't think that um, a denial of the um, ability of the public to uh, uh, obtain direct access um, um, should be eliminated um, when there is a technical solution uh, to a problem that does occur occasionally. Um, and I also wanted to say I'd support the uh, section uh, that deletes the release of uh, meeting minutes from five to 10 days. Um, in this day and age, I think it's pretty fair to say that most meeting minutes are taken on a computer or a tablet or by some electronic means. And, and uh, uh, because of that, a keystroke is really all that's needed to uh, release meeting, uh, meeting minutes. And um, if there's concern that the meeting minutes um, might have mistakes in them, well, meeting minutes, um, from my experience, um, are never approved minutes until the next meeting anyway. If one of the first orders of a business is always additions and corrections to the meetings minutes from the previous meeting. And uh, um, particularly at times of emergency, um, I think getting information out to the public um, uh, is important to one, give the public the confidence that the public officials are in fact um, acting uh, in, in behalf of the public interest. And um, uh, so delay, delaying minutes um, is kind of undermining um, the ability of, of public bodies to address the emergency. Um, so um, those are the two areas that I, I wanted to speak of. And I, I just um, appreciate the work the committee's doing and um, uh, you're going in the right direction and thank you. Thank you, Ross, for being with us. I appreciate your um, perspective on that. Uh, any questions for Mr. Connolly? All right, who's got a strong preference to push us in a direction here? We, we need not to be uh, spending all day in committee, even though I love hanging out with you guys in the little Zoom room. Um, and it would be my goal that we, uh, that we have a sense of where we're going and then we push pause until before, just before the floor this afternoon to give anyone else uh, who needs to speak to us on this the opportunity to react to what we're doing. So John Gannon. Um, thank you. I, I mean, I, I think given the amount of time left in the session um, that and you know, making sure we educate our fellow members uh, about this bill, um, streamlining the bill to what is absolutely necessary, um, I, I think it is important uh, because, uh, and I think you know, dealing with the ballot issues for town meeting and special meeting um, are, are what's critical. Um, I, I think you know, we should try to tackle or at least come to a decision about what we should do for petitions for local candidates. Um, you know, electronic signatures would be fine with me. Um, I mean, I, I do understand um, Mike's concerns um, and some other concerns voiced by people, um, but I also understand Rob's pushback to that is we allowed ourselves as candidates um, for office not to have to file petitions. Um, and I think, you know, that's a, a very, very fair comment. Why should we hold local candidates to a higher standard than we held ourselves? And I think we need to think carefully about that. Um, but I think, you know, given the amount of time we have, you know, streamlining the bill is important. Thank you. Okay. Other uh, perspectives? Jim. I'm good with that approach. 
time, time is short and uh, we, we January is like really not very far away um, <laughs> and we can take up the other measures for um, future emergencies. Uh, and I'm sorry if that disappoints anybody that worked hard in the Senate version, but time is really, really short. All right, uh, any other? You're, you're breaking up, Madam Chair. Hmm. You're frozen. Did someone take frozen. a picture of that? Okay, I will. I got it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm for clarification here. So where, where are we on this? We've sort of debated a lot this morning. Are we going to circle back to that? We're talking primarily about communities voting by Australian ballot that would normally vote in person. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it appears that the, the chair is out. So Betsy Ann, what, you just raise your hand. Do you want to answer Rob's question? I, I just kind of want, I'm also trying to get a feel for where you're at. Here's what I'm hearing is that so far, it sounds like committee members are wanting to just focus on what's necessary to do. Um, right now, the issue that's on the table is this strike all that would apply to town and school district annual meetings. Um, let's, let, let's also the special meetings. I'm, I have a question as to whether you need to put any or you want to put any time constraints on the uh, or otherwise amend the special meeting language. Um, but if you are going to focus just on annual and special meetings in this bill, the issues that I have that are hanging out here so far are um, whether you're going to allow the electronic meetings um, in light of the Secretary of State's office's concerns about how to confirm the voters. You've got the issue of whether candidates um, need to get voter petitions, um, and if so, whether they're electronic. And then you've got the funding question for requiring Australian ballot. Right. So. Karen Hoard said she'd get back to us with the, the funding question. Um, okay. So hopefully we'll have an answer by 2.30 this afternoon when we're going to meet again. Okay. Uh, so Rob, Bob, sorry. This so might be an inane point, but when I was talking about electronic signatures, I have no desire to require that formal electronic signature and email is fine. So let's, what do people want to do on the, on the petitions for local candidates? Um, oops, push back. I mean, even to our level, it's only 50, right? Senator is how much if we even bumped it up? Is that under consideration also? That's no, it. no, you're just focused on local elections, candidate okay. petitions for local elections. So the general law for local elections, um, municipal elections, is 30 signatures or 1% of the town. Okay. Which have 30 valid signatures of the voters or 1% of the legal voters of the municipality, whichever is less. Now, that's the general municipal law. Charters might require more signatures for some of our bigger municipalities. John? Rob? Okay. I, I have to confess I'm, I confess, I'm very conflicted about this. I, I really am. But I struggle with holding local officials to a higher standard than what was 
than we were held to earlier, especially if the same conditions exist. In other words, we're under state of emergency. Um, I, I, I do struggle with that. Um, but I also recognize timing is of the essence. If, if we allow this to, to go through as what's initially proposed here, Realistically, is there time to go back and visit this in early January with that 60 day window in place? Betsy Ann, can you answer that? Or? Well, moving to Australian ballot, it sounds like that needs to, you would need to have that figured out for um, before you adjourn because as I understand it was speaking to VLCT, there are deadlines in place that require at least 60 days um, for a town to move to Australian ballot. So it sounds like you have to decide this question of whether to require Australian ballots before you adjourn. I think that, let's see, for in general law for candidate petitions for the um, annual meeting, uh, the general municipal law is that they have to be filed not later than the sixth Monday preceding the day of the election. So I haven't counted back yet to see what that is. Right. So it sounds like we have, there is some time for the, the candidates for petitions, but it does sound like that we'd have to make a decision, I guess today around the Australian ballot question. And for me, a fair amount of that will be the funding. If we can get that answered, then I, I think I know where I am, but. So just so you all saw, you know, Sarah put in the sixth Monday is January 19th. So that would leave us very little time um, to address the petition thing. I mean, because we'd have to get through both the house and the Senate mm -hmm. um, and be signed by the governor. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure it's possible um, to do that um, by January 19th. So this this bill is boiling down to these two issues. Is that what you you gather, John? The yes, the candidates uh, and the Australian ballot. Right, and and I agree with you. We need to wait um, to hear back from Karen Horn about the money issue. Yeah. Um, but just putting that aside for now, I mean, are people okay with streamlining the bill? Just thumbs up or, okay. Is anybody not comfortable with it? Okay. Ross? I just have a question in streamlining it. Would you keep the requirement that uh, uh, public access be a shell on the agenda, the information, so that the uh, public can have direct access to any public meeting? No, the, the, the sections that, that would be in the streamlined bill would deal with the Australian ballot issue um, and potentially the petition for local candidates. Since most of the other sections can be delayed until January and we can address it in January, I mean, we can actually get a bill in right now um, and, you know, have it ready to go when we first meet um, again. Mike, you had a comment? Yeah, I just want to say I, I saw the draft uh, that, that Betsy and put together and I'm good to go with that. Let's just keep it simple and move it out. Okay. A anybody feel strongly about the petition issue? Jim. Sorry. Um, I, you know, I, I think um, has been mentioned before, and I don't want to belabor it. Um, I, I do think we, I was not a fan of doing away with the petition for state office. Um, but we did it, and I don't know why we would hold ourselves to a different standard. Um, you know, our local transfer station is where, you know, you generally go to get petitions, and we're 
I can't even do my dump and donuts this fall. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we, it's, it's, um, it's now called dump and go, you know, they don't want you hanging around. So, um, I think, you know, we just make a one-time e exception um, and, and move on. Um, that's just my two cents. I'm not hung up either way. I do think as a rule, I agree with uh, Mike, you know, people ought to put some effort into running rather than just put their name on it. But uh, this is a very strange time, so. JP? I guess I agree with some of those comments and I could go along with that. Okay. I'm not wild over it, but I could go along with that. Safety, thinking safety first, but I think it's probably a good move for us to do that. Okay. So I, I guess a number of people have spoken to the petition issue. Oh, Marsha, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand up. Go right, right ahead. Thank you. Uh, just a question. Um, when does this waiver on the petition signatures end? I know it's part of the uh, COVID emergency language, but do we have a date on that? That's so I, I think um, you could have it just so it applies to the annual meetings. You would put it in this subsection A, if, if, if I'm understanding where you're wanting to go with this. So it would be a suspension of the requirement to obtain mm -hmm. voter signatures to have a candidate's name placed on the ballot for the annual meeting. Is that where the committee's going? Thumbs up on this. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that we can, you know, the next legislature can come back and take a look at this uh, with more time to, to really debate it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm okay with that. I just, I'm trying to think through this. If, if let's say that the state of emergency was lifted the end of January, um, are we running into any issues where somehow people get caught in kind of a catch-22 where they don't have the time to do it they could possibly be required to do you know what i mean well, um the, the 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 draft amendment does not reference the state of emergency and, and my thought out on that is even if we are not in a state of emergency in march of 2021 um it is unlikely that there will be a COVID-19 vaccine um, available and that there will still be potential issues um, with people getting together, um, you know, for a petition drive or anything like that. So, I, I mean, I, I didn't want to tie this um, draft amendment to um, the state of emergency because um, decisions are going to have to be made before or um, in December for some of this stuff. And I just think, I, I just think there, we are still going to be in an abnormal situation in March um, until there is community um, immunity um, through a vaccine, which, you know, from what I'm reading is not going to be in March of 2021. Okay, because so am I interpreting part B here in, incorrect there what it refers to the COVID-19 state of emergency? Yeah, and that's for special meetings. And that was my next question is whether you want or need to address special meetings. A is only about the annual meeting, the 2021 annual meeting of a town or school district. And I'm B, the special meeting authority is a separate question. And I, I do wonder okay. whether you want to pursue that. Okay, that's where my confusion was. Jim, you have a question? Yeah, on the special meeting, um, if your budget goes down or your school board budget goes down, uh, then you schedule a special meeting. How how much time between those? And Tucker, do you have that info offhand? I do not, but I can find it momentarily. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's shortly thereafter, 
which sometimes they seem to be, um, you know, you maybe you need to have the same provisions in place. That's a good point, Jim. Okay. Uh, she does make one occasionally. Um, you know, I'm so really impressed that the vice chair lowers your hand for you. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I just stopped raising Warren? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, Warren? I'm, I'm looking to agree with Jim. I, th I think we need uh, the B paragraph as well. Okay, and I'm looking at the, uh, well, this is about, I don't know if this is the right provision, but Tucker, I'm looking at 17 BSA 2680. This is about the budget being rejected, but that's only for an Australian ballot budget. That just says if it's rejected, if the budget's revoted, the budget voted on by Australian ballot is rejected, which would apply, right? Because everybody's going to be using Australian ballot. Um, the legislative body shall establish a date for the vote on the revised budget, budget and take appropriate steps to warn it. So everybody under A would be doing Australian ballot unless you're they're going to be able to have that authority to uh, do it by electronic means, which is still an open question, or unless they're going to be able to hold their floor vote safely in accordance with state guidance. So, And Betsy, looking at that language, I would assume that that date that the legislative body is going to choose for the revote is still going to be a special meeting yeah. because it's falling outside of the annual meeting. Yep. And under 17 BSA section 2643, Special meeting shall be warned 60 days in advance of the, or within yeah. 60 days of the receipt of the application. Okay. Okay. So there's still that 60 day requirement for warning a special meeting. Okay. So well, that was a special meeting, sorry, on uh, application of 5% of the voters. But it's, yeah, but, otherwise, legislative body warns a special meeting when it deems it necessary. So it seems like that special meeting language in the amendment could work but it's only if they're they're um we're still in a state of emergency under subsection b rob so so if we remove anything that is relating to the state of emergency and just say that during this time period referring to the covid 19 concerns then we could go through and authorize Australian ballot. And then if there's any special meetings or anything like that, that could still be done through Australian ballot as well and give, so we don't have to worry about the state of emergency. It gives the authorization that's needed to be given to allow to carry out the elections and the votes, correct? I think we'll need a revision to the language if you don't want to have the special meetings contingent, the special meeting Australian ballot authority contingent on us still being in a state of emergency. Maybe you could craft the language to say any budget revotes necessary as a result of the annual meeting shall be held by Australian ballot. That would get to the heart of Jim's question, wouldn't it? I think so. Representative Harrison, if you were just focused on the budget revotes that were necessary. Yeah, yes, that's all I was thinking of because those are the ones that come quickly afterwards. Okay, so um, unless you're seeing a, another need for to have the subsection B language for special meetings generally, maybe you could change that to just be limited to um, Australian ballots being used for a budget revote after the annual meeting. I don't see VLCT with us anymore. Um, they're probably chasing $2 million. <laughs> yeah.
But just so Tucker and Betsy Ann, could you just clarify? Um, I mean, even if there's a special meeting, it has to be warned 60 days out, correct? Is that what you were saying, Tucker? Or just so we understand. I think Betsy had called out that the 60 day requirement is actually for special meetings that are called in response to voter petition. Okay. Otherwise, the default and Betsy, please feel free to correct me here is not less than 30 or more than 40 days. You got it. Okay. So mm -hmm. 30 day minimum, unless it's uh, upon petition of the voters and then 60 days. And that's just the warning. So uh, that, the, that the meeting has to be held not less than 30 nor more than 40 days um, after the warning. So otherwise, it's, I think it's that um, if it's not by a voter, um, a voter application for a special meeting, it's the legislative body may warn a special meeting when it deems it necessary. Maybe you can have subsection B just there as is, as belts and suspenders, but then have a special provision for budget revotes having to be held by Australian ballot. So there's no question about that. Okay. How do people feel about that? Okay. Anybody opposed to that? Okay. All right, we've got those two issues. I think your other issue you need to have to figure out is the elect whether to allow electronic um, annual meetings. That's correct. I mean, um, Deputy um, Secretary of State Winters did have concerns about that. I do know that Brattleboro held a representative town meeting electronically, I believe via Zoom. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of any towns um, that have attempted that. Um, obviously a representative town meeting is different because you know exactly how many people are going to be there versus a regular town meeting. You have no idea whether one or 500 people will show up. Um, but I mean, I'm, you know, if, if the Secretary of State's office is concerned about this, I mean, I think it might be wise to um, delete it from the proposed amendment. Anybody else have thoughts? I, I agree with you, John. I, I think that while the intention is good, I think that there's some logistics concerns that need to be worked out. So would everybody be happy if we took that language out? Just thumbs up. All right. Uh, Warren, you have a question? Just that if we delete the possibility of holding an annual meeting through electronic means, how in the world are you going to hold an, an annual meeting? By Australian ballot. Yeah. Or the other option is that the legislative body, the select board, on or before December 31st of this year, can hold can determine to hold a meeting um, consistent with state guidance um, on or indoor meetings. So there are two ways. One's by Australian ballot, and the other is by um, just following um, state protocol with respect to indoor meetings. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Marsha? So what would happen with Brattleboro's representative form of town meeting. They've already had one by Zoom. Would this include them? Would it eliminate that possibility for them? That's a good question. Yeah, as currently written, um, if you're just going to strike one, 
I guess you could have a, an exception for, I mean, I don't, I don't know how they were authorized to do that if it was in their charter. Um, perhaps you could make an exception for towns that are able to uh, um, hold their meeting through electronic means pursuant to provisions authorized in law, otherwise authorized in law. I'm assuming that they use the temporary open meeting law provisions because technically the representatives are a public body that could take advantage of that, but okay. I cannot give a definitive legal opinion on that, not knowing how they carried out that meeting. I thought we passed something just for Brattleboro. That was to allow their legislative body to adopt a tax rate because they were not oh. capable of holding their budget and tax meeting because it fell later than the state of emergency declaration. Okay, thank you. So Betsy and the, the open meeting provisions may or may not apply next year. They wouldn't apply, would they? Or? The uh, current open meeting law provisions will continue through the declared state of emergency in response to COVID-19. Okay. So they could still hold a representative town meeting in March as long as we were still in a state of emergency. If that is where they are gaining their authority to do so from. Yeah. If that's the case, maybe um, in this amendment, you just remove reference to representative annual town meeting. Does that make yeah. sense? Everyone? I'm not seeing anyone object to that. Because Brattleboro is the only town that has a representative annual town meeting. Okay. Okay. I think you're getting there. Um, you do need an effective date. I forgot to include that. Um, <laughs> that would be on passage. Okay. Unless you want to extend it out for some reason, but I don't no, oh, why there could be a reason to do yeah. that. And then there's just, you know, the, the funding I'm inferring would be included in the budget anyway, right? Yeah. I, I don't think it would we be. Need, before we can vote on this, we need an answer to that question. Yeah, okay. Okay, so here's what I'm hearing. Let me, let's just recap. Um, you're gonna go with this uh, annual meeting language you're going to eliminate um, the requirement for local candidates to get voter signatures in order to have the candidate's name placed on the local, um, on the annual town meeting ballot. Um, you're going to provide that any necessary budget revotes shall be held by Australian ballot. You're going to delete reference to um, town, annual town meeting authority to be held by electronic means. You're gonna remove reference to representative annual town meetings so that they may be able to use the open meeting law authority to meet electronically and add an effective date. And I think keep the special meeting language as is, but that special meeting authority for a legislative body to use the Australian ballot system for a special meeting only applies um, during the COVID state of emergency. I think that covers it. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? Nope, okay. Um, then I think we can adjourn the meeting and get back together at 2.30 right before floor starts. Um, okay, so Andrew.